ajma'in amma ba'd. Now everybody should be able to hear me, inshallah. I have, I have the right mic on today. <laughs> uh, so last week uh, we had started talking, or not last week, but uh, for the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about zakat. Uh, what zakat is applicable to, what zakat doesn't apply to, and how zakat is actually supposed to be given. In the coming weeks, we'll talk about how the zakat is to be paid out. Uh, and we'll talk about who it is supposed to be paid out to and on um, which individuals are actually eligible to receive zakat and which organizations uh, help with the zakat. So I'll try to give some examples of some organizations and what they do with that. Uh, there are organizations, for example, that take a share and take a percentage of that for their for their oversight and for their overhead and their costs. Is that permissible uh, or does an individual have to take care of it himself uh, as an individual? So there are certain things that are not taxable that um, some people uh, actually gives a cat on uh, personal jewelry is one of them. So personal jewelry is a big issue of uh, khilaf and... Um, so if I own, as a man, for example, if I owned a silver ring, uh, as a woman, if I owned a gold necklace or gold earrings, then you have a number of scholars who will say that you have to pay zakat on that. And then you have a number of scholars who say, no, you don't. Uh, it's actually the majority. So you have the Madikiya, the Shafi, and the Hanabla. They say you do not have to give zakat on jewelry. And the Ahnaf and the Lahriya, they say that you do have to give zakat on jewelry. Why do you guys think that difference of opinion came about? There is a clear hadith when the Prophet sure. asked his wife, Aisha, pay, Aisha. yep. Uh, the car, uh -huh. this jewelry, this sure. Necklace. So these, these scholars, uh, the Madikis and the Shafis and the Hanbalis, um, why is it that they disregard this hadith? But very surprisingly, you'll find the, the Hanafis utilizing it, right? So usually you don't find that. Um, and, and the reason for that is the exposure to a hadith in Kufa at the time of Imam Abu Hanifa was more stringent and more limited because of the people that were around him. So there was more doubt in how the hadith were reaching him. So there you'll find many times less use of a hadith and more use of Qiyas or more use of other academic tools. So this seems to be the opposite here. So why do we feel, why would these three Imams ignore that hadith or ignore those hadith? Possibly like just Aklan, what are some of the possibilities that are there? Context. Okay, context is something that is extremely, extremely, extremely important. We've talked about this time and time again, how sometimes we have a hadith, and when we look at the apparent hadith, we will think that this is haram or this is halal, when the reality is, is that it can be makruh or it can be uh, mustahab, or it cannot even be applicable. So like sometimes it's situational, right? Sometimes it's situational. Uh, some common hadith, like hadith about pictures, the Prophet وسلم, what did he say about the angels and the relationship with pictures? The hadith is in Bukhari. They won't come, sir. Huh. The, they won't, the angels won't enter the house where there are pictures and dogs, right? So, so now what has happened is that you have a number of scholars who will say that based on this, pictures in general, and we're not talking about photography. Photography is a different issue altogether. But like painted images, these are absolutely impermissible. But in those same hadith, you have the Prophet ﷺ taking the curtain and Aisha turning it into a what? Into a pillow. She turns it into a pillow. It's still in the house, right? It's still in the house. What happened? So again, and, and that's, a, that's a different discussion for a different time. The only reason I'm sharing that is to show that there are things that have context. And sometimes we only see part of the picture or we'll take the wording and, and we'll apply it absolutely, right? We'll apply it absolutely and that's not always appropriate. Um, the ruling on boxing, many, many scholars say it is what? Boxing, MMA, they'll say it's haram, why? Because the statement of the Prophet ﷺ, he says, He said, don't strike the face because Allah has created Adam in his image. Meaning that Allah is the one that created him like this, so don't hit him in the face. The problem is, Imam Muslim, he narrates this hadith in Kitab al-Itq, in the book of manumission. Imam al-Nasai narrates it in the book of women. 
Imam Abu Dawood, he narrates it in the Book of Children. So what do those scholars of Hadith who are actually bringing the Hadith to us, what context are they putting it in? And why did they not put it in Kitab al-Jihad? Because you're supposed to repeat in the face of the yeah. All right, during, okay, meaning that there's what? Exception. There's exceptions. And not just that, if we look at the position of slaves, the position of women and the position of children, usually when Allah talks about striking them or the Prophet talks about striking them, why are they being struck? Why are they being hit? Uh, for, for, for what? This is for ta'deeb, right? To bring uh, out of uh, discipline. So how do we take all this into context? That when you hit, because you're disciplining your child or your slave, what should you not hit? You should not hit in the face. Very different context, correct? Again, I'm not going to go too much into it. I just only want to share these examples to show that context is critically, critically, critically important. One of the reasons we study the seerah, so we can see how the Prophet actually acted out the Quran. Right, So these things are really important and we have to keep all of those things in mind. Which brings us to this point. Now, you said that one of the reasons that these scholars don't utilize the hadith is because there's a context that's there. What context could be there? So when the Prophet Sallallahu he saw Aisha with two gold bangles, like heavy, like they're heavy, they're, they're described as heavy, gold, uh, no, not bangles. Yeah, the bangles, right? They're uh, gold, heavy gold bangles. He said to her, he said, have you given zakat on these? And Aisha, she said, no. The Prophet said, he said, would you like these to be a fire for you on the day of judgment? Implying that there is zakat on these things. So what context can we put to that? What can we add to that? What do you guys think? Or it was uh, a certain way, or was it, maybe it wasn't a jeweler per se, but it was just a piece of chunks of metal. Chunks of metal. Uh, yeah. user. I mean, it's possible. It's this possibility, but I think that's a small possibility. Is it possible that Aisha dealt with gold as a when she was a jeweler, and she sold gold? She bought and sold gold as a profession. Is it possible? Uh -huh. It's possible, right? That she came across these and these are because, or it was in her family and somebody from the family let her borrow them, right? So there, there are a number of things and there are a number of scenarios that definitely can apply to that, right? She could, or there is, there's a certain amount in the Prophet of some sought to be excessive. So in order to discourage excess, what did he say? To give zakat on them. Not just that, we talked about how zakat is used and sadaqah is used in the Quran and the Sunnah. How are they used? Uh, they're used as synonyms, right? There's no difference between zakat and sadaqah when used in the Quran or when used in the sunnah. When did that differentiation come? During their time? During the time of the process? No, it came later. Why did it come later? To help us. <laughs> this is like to help us differentiate. Because when we think of zakat, we think of what? And something that's an obligation. And when we think of sadaqah, we think of? It's recommended, right? It's something that we should do. So when the Prophet ﷺ said, do you not give us a sadaqah on these, what is it possible that he meant? That as thanks for Allah blessing you with these, you should give what? You should give sadaqah. That's one aspect, right? That's just the siyaq, that's just the context. What is another possibility that the other scholars did not utilize the hadith? Well, maybe the wooden year has not passed at the time. The hawl? Uh, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't give zakat unless the hawl, unless the year came. But I'm asking, why wouldn't they utilize the hadith? We said context is one. What is, what is another reason? Okay, that gives us some insight too. Is, but the, the, the problem with this hadith is that you can only use the argument and the Prophet's words being used or the meaning being used if there's something being relayed on a generality. Here is a specific story. 
right? So the, for the specific stories, the context argument can be used very well. But when it comes to the Prophet Nabi, the Prophet prohibited, this is being relayed by wording, and at that point, we can take it from haram to makruh. Or ojib and nabi, the Prophet obligated, we can take it from wajib to mustahab. We can take it from obligation to recommend it. So we said context was one. What is the second? Very important. Why would scholars not use a hadith? Practice of the Sahaba. Okay, the practice of the Sahaba indicates what about a hadith? They did not. They, they did not think of it as obligation. Okay, either it can bring down. So this goes back to context. If the companions didn't act on something, or they acted on something, it shows us how they. Uh, understood, right? And if they, that tells us how they understood it, we can see on how to practically impose it in our lives. Like, so again, that's part of context. What else? There's one very big important thing that a, re, a person, including us, what are some reasons we don't utilize a hadith? I say, this, somebody brings me a hadith, I'll be like, no, no. How can I say no, no? Or okay, maybe, but I was saying, there's even a clear reason that all, all of us use. There's a clear reason all of us use, whether it's authentic, whether it's authentic or not. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I said, why would you not use a hadith? I didn't say a sahih hadith. <laughs> no, no, no. The context, the, so the context is important if the hadith is sahih. And if the hadith is not, it's not going to be used, right? It's especially in halal and haram, especially, right? When it comes to issues of halal and haram, if the hadith is not sahih, you will have scholars that will dismiss it, right? They'll dismiss it. And these are usually the two reasons. Context, context can be found, it can be understanding, it could be the situation, it could be a specific case, right? All of those apply. And secondly, the grade of the hadith. Is it sahih or not? And if it's not sahih, then the scholars would reject it. Well, sahih, I mean accepted. Um, so they say that it is not taxable, and there could be a number of reasons for that. If it has a permissible use, all of them agree, if it is not being used permissibly, if I'm using gold utensils, if I have a gold fork, or I have a gold spoon, or I have a gold plate, then I have to give zakat on those things. Why? Because haram. Ah, because they're haram uses. And when the use becomes haram, I'm not using it the way Allah intended, so I will be taxed, I will have to give zakat on those items. And the generality, why is it taxable? Uh, number one, the, the Hanafis, they use the generality of the ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to give zakat on gold and silver. He didn't say what type of gold and silver. The opposite argument is like, okay, because he didn't say the type, there are going to be what? Are the, do we give zakat on all, all types of cattle and livestock? No, there's a type. And the same thing with gold and silver, we give zakat on gold and silver of a certain type, yeah. right? When it's being used as a currency. Uh, there are other arguments that a number of scholars bring. They say one of the reasons that zakat is not given on personal jewelry is why? What do you guys think? I want you guys to think of reasons. I'm being, it's being used like, so how come I don't give zakat on my soap? Why don't I give it on my car? Why don't I give it on my house? Why? Because I'm using those things and this falls in the same category. The other problem is, is if a woman, all she owns is this personal jewelry. If all she has is this gold or silver, two things happen. If all I have as a woman is a gold necklace, when it comes time to give zakat on this necklace, what do I do? I have to sell it. Right? There's nothing I can do. I don't have any other money, so I have to sell. I, either I sell it or what do I do? I have to borrow. I have to borrow money or I have to do the third, which most likely happens. My husband pays for it, right? <laughs> you, can, you can borrow money. Yeah, yeah. yeah because oh, what is the fault? The fault is to give this the cap. Okay. Right? The fault is to give this the cap. So you have to give this the cap. If you borrow it, you can always pay the person back yeah. later. Exactly. You can always pay the person back later. So, so that, that's the issue. When, an ind when a woman has a set of jewel, like a jewelry set, if she has a necklace, if she has earrings, right? If she has a nose ring, whatever the case might be, when it comes time to give the zakat, she ends up breaking the set. And the idea behind gold and silver is that it, is, it has the potential to increase. Can this jewelry increase? No, right? I, I have to sell it for it to increase. 
but it by itself it doesn't have any particular a uh, trade value versus having gold or silver bars right if i have money it's it's liquid i can use it and i can spend it can i go to the store if i go to safeway or if i go to any other place i can actually turn the gold into currency and to and do something with it can i do the same can i go to the bank with my necklace <laughs> And, and trade it in to get them. No, I can't. And and that's one of the reasons. Or like I, a nama is one of the reasons that many scholars, or the ability to grow, is the reason that many scholars tax these items. The same thing with livestock. The same thing with products and plants and all of these things that grow because they themselves grow and they create more money. And even money, if I invest it, what happens? It creates more money so anything that has the potential to grow it can be taxed if it does not have the potential to grow like my house or my car or my shoes like these don't have the potential to grow this is one of the reasons that they are not taxed what is yeah. this uh great this hadith is great this had yeah, most of the scholars said this week most scholars say it's weak the hadith hash it's it's only you have a few modern scholars from the albani who said it was uh, hassan and said it was accepted uh, but most like uh, scholars of the past, like most muhaddithin of the past, they said, no, they said, this is hadith is uh, weak. Okay. Uh, debts. This is something that we were supposed to start talking about last week. There are two types of debts. There are two types of debts. There are good debts, which is debts that I can actually recover. And I let Nazim borrow $500. I know, yeah. <laughs> I know that he will give me the money back, right? But if I give five hundred dollars to Mahdi, this is going to be a bad debt, right? <laughs> 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 So th these are the type of debts that we have, right? We have good debts that these are debts that we can actually recover and we can get back and bad debts that we don't. Even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did he say about loans? If a person gives two dinar in loans, it is like he's giving one dinar, one dinar in charity, right? This is what how loans are used. This is how the the yun are in Islam that they are meant to be a means to uplift and empower. They are not meant to be a means for trade. They're not meant to be a means for business, which is what most of the financial institutions are built on today. In Islam, it has always been a form of sadaqa. In Islam, it has always been a way of like, uh, of uh, husna ta'amul. It's always been a way of bringing people up and upraising them. It's never been a business. It's never meant to be a business. And, and many of us, we know in our hearts, when I let somebody borrow money, in the back of my mind, what do I have? Right, there's a chance, there's a good chance that this person is not going to pay me back. And, and we still give the money, hoping that we get the money back, but many times we don't. So there are, two, like I said, there are two types of debts. How do we deal with those debts depends on the type of debt, number one, and also, of course, as we've seen throughout the course, the, the madhab. So here, if I have $50,000 and I let somebody borrow it and I didn't get it back for 20 years, according to the Hanafis and the Hanbalis, what did we say? Like the Hanabila in general, what did we say about uh, zakat and taxing? There is a chance to tax. Right, if there's a chance to tax, they will tax. So the Hanafis and the Hanbalis, they will say that every year, for every year that passed, it, even if it took 20 years, you're going to have to back pay the, the zakat. You're going to have to back pay the zakat. The Madakis, they say that you only pay tax on one year, and you would pay yearly according to the Shafis. Yeah. What is the logic? for one year uh, because, because that is basically that is the time you received it and that is part of your hold uh, right so if my my lunar fiscal year when it comes wherever it comes in that it would be added part as part of my fiscal year and that's why i would pay the the account because it's almost like i held it for a year because the moment i get it um this one i understand the least like i'm not really <laughs> I'm not really sure. Uh, yeah, like if you don't have it, I'm not. I, I don't. I don't really get it. Um, how how that's dealt with, but but basically. Oh no no. I'm sorry. I remember now. This you would pay. Like I, it's the most difficult one, because you pay over here. When do you pay? When you get. When you get the money. Over here. When do you pay? When you get the money. Over here. When do you pay? Every year. Every year, even if you don't have the money. <laughs> So th this one is the most penalizing. I think I think this one's the most difficult. And there's a minority humbly opinion that actually says you don't have to give any. 
Why? Because you don't have to sort of, right? And we, we had spoken about this before. There's, there's a difference between ownership and the ability to spend. And there are scholars who will separate between these two, which is why you have differences of opinion here. Over here, they only look at what? The ownership. Over here, they look at both, but there's still a penalty that's there. Over here, they look at both, and there's less of a penalty that's here. Uh, go ahead. So for the first one, yeah. they pass, they that yeah. Does that mean like when he gets the money, mm. he has to like let's say for twenty years? He yes, he has to he has to pay twenty years worth of taxes, right? So you would pay twenty years worth of back ta back taxes. This you can't even wait. As as soon as the zakat, as soon as your your haul comes, you have to give it. and You have to add it as if it's yours. This one, the time when you get it, then you would add it to that. And then there are some scholars again that we said that don't. Uh, if I cannot recover, right? This is if I atawaka. This is if I believe I'm going to get it. If I believe I'm going to get it. So if I talk about 20 years, if I talk about 20 years, which category do you guys think generally? What does it fall under? Is it good or bad debt? Right. This generally is bad, right? Like because when we think of good, when do I usually think if it's something that's good? What is a good timeline? I mean, as soon as possible, no doubt. But in general, like in our heads, like culturally, how, what would that be? Within a year? Like I would say within a year, maybe even two, right? Depending on how large the, the uh, debt is. So within a year or two, I think that would be good because culturally that's how we understand it. Anything more than that would be considered bad. So how, I'm sorry. Okay, khalas. So um, what is bad debt? So you would, you would pay tax on the years that have passed once collected. So meaning that if I never get the money, I never have to pay? Zika. Right? If I never get the $50, I never have to pay it. But the moment I get it, according to the Shafis and the Hanbalis, you still, you would give it when you receive it and you would pay the back taxes. You would pay tax on one year if you were Maliki. Not very different from what they believe it's good. They don't differentiate between good or bad. And this is where the Hanafis say that there is no tax that's given if it is bad debt. Even if you get it, even if you get it, you wouldn't pay tax on it. When would you actually pay? In this, no, in this case, you would, but you would pay it with your fiscal year. Does that make sense? Oh, with the new fiscal year. With the new yeah, fiscal year. After you. Not after, you, after, you, after you've established possession, yeah. you would pay it the next fiscal year. Yes. Uh, are there different types of debts? Yes, there are. Even with good and bad, you still have more categories too. You have investment versus consumption. What does that mean? And then you also have short-term versus long-term. What does that mean? And how do we differentiate between these? Firstly, I think it's important to understand these. What is investment and what is consumption? What is an investment debt and what is a consumption debt? Investment debt when you raise funds to... to Buy a land, buy a property. Ah, for, uh, like, buy something, equipment. something that will generate or generate income. Type in consumption. Oh. I'm borrowing money to pay rent. I'm borrowing money to eat. I'm borrowing. You know, you understand? Like basically, this money is not going to bring any money. This, this one, this consumption. I'm taking the money because I'm going to. I'm going to eat it. I'm going to use it for personal use. This is going to be a business use. So when we talk about investments, there's going to be a business use in that. Why is this different? We'll talk about it. Short term and long term. Like if I have a debt that I owe to someone that I have to pay back versus student loans versus a mortgage, right? These are very long term debts. Do I deal with them in the same way? And, and we'll talk about that. Uh, did, I, did I bring it? Okay, no, I didn't. So I have to talk about it here, sorry. <laughs> so basically, what do you guys think? Is there a zakat on investment? And is there a zakat on consumption? Investments, Investments there's a zakat, okay. And consumption? So if I'm borrowing $10,000, if I'm borrowing $10,000 to eat, who would pay the zakat? You borrow, so I'm borrowing. So the, the creditor would pay. 
Uh, okay, this is where the difference is going to come. Basically, if I'm borrowing money to eat for a car, for a fridge, something for me for my personal use, then the creditor would pay the zakat. If I'm borrowing for an investment, who pays the zakat? The person. Huh? The creditor, the one who gave the money, no. the debtor, yeah. the one who borrowed. Yeah. So. The debtor would pay it. Why? Because he's using this money. Remember, we said nama. We said growth. Yeah. In consumption, there's no, there's no growth. But in investment, there is growth. And that's why, because even in the madhab, we said the zakat is attached to the money or the person. It's attached to the money, right? It's not attached to the person. And it always is going to depend on who gives it and how they give it. Okay? How does the credit know if this loan is being used for investment or it, it's it has to be stated at the time so and we do that and we do that in our normal business dealings right when i i take a loan if i go to the bank i have to tell them that this is what type of loan or what type of loan this is going to be a personal loan or this is going to be an investment loan and this is the same thing that we need to do with each other as Muslims. If I'm taking money, I need to identify, I need to be very clear. Is this a personal loan or is this an investment loan? Based on that, I as the creditor and I as the debtor will know who has to give the zakat on the money. Like short term and long term. If I have short term loans, if I owe somebody money, is that tax deductible? If I have a long term loan that I have to pay, is that tax deductible? So if I owe $300,000 on my house, this is a debt, yes? This is a debt. And I have $50,000 in my bank account. Do I give zakat or no? Yes. Because mortgage is not deductible. Right, okay. Except for its installment. Right, so the installments is gonna be subtracted as the months go anyway, right? So there are different ways to look at it. Either I look at where I'm at, at the end of my hod, at the end of my fiscal year, or I take the whole year and I subtract the debt that I had, or I can take the whole debt and subtract it from how much money I have. Why don't I subtract the whole debt? Well, I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a huge problem, right? Who will pay zakat? And if that's the case, how many people, I don't think people actually do this, but how many people will escape zakat because they keep buying properties or they keep taking out large loans? So I'm giving zakat. We agree on that. Why is it in this situation I'm allowed to give zakat? I'm supposed to give zakat. I won't even say allowed. I'm supposed to give zakat. Why? What is some of the reasoning? An it's, it's a type of investment loan, right? It's a type of investment loan, but can I argue the same for a car? That's, that, that works for a house, but can I argue the same for a car? If I owe $20,000 on a car, can I subtract, is that tax deductible? Well, if you own a Ferrari, I would say, yeah, you must give a cab. But if you <laughs> bought something simple just to get around you, it's a Tarura, I would say, no. You can but deduct it. I can. So if I have a Toyota, so it has to go on the type of car? I, this is how I feel. Like, I mean, if you're pretty rich and you're buying like uh, 200,000 yeah. Ferrari, yeah. and you say, oh, I'm, I'm going to deduct it from my assets. Yeah. That would be. I mean, th th that's that's part of legal tax uh, loopholes, right? Whoa. Even in Islam, we have some of these tax loopholes. And over here, how do we make? Because we need something that is solid that we can rely on. So over here, how do I determine what is extra and what is not? Okay, that's that's definitely part of it. But even here, like I have a five-year loan on my car, and I owe twenty thousand dollars on this car. What do I do? Do I deduct it or no? And why? And it's not invest. It's not an investment anymore, right? It's a consumption. It's consumption for sure. It's not too long term. <laughs> okay, Se seven year. I ex I got a seven year on my car. Is this long term yet or no? Well, it's still consumption. It's still consumption. It's not. That's not going to change. What is the relationship of the debtor to the creditor? In this in this setup, in this long term setup, 
And it, what type of loan is it? Is it a good loan or a bad loan in general? No. Why is it bad? Because you don't the 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 creditor doesn't think he's going to get the money back. I think bad bad loan is not about the term. It's about if you have broken the promise. Yeah, it, like basically, do you do does the creditor feel he's going to get his money back or not? It's like seven years. Yeah, seven years on a car. No. No. Then why did he approve the loan? <laughs> huh? The goodness of his heart. Allah Akbar. Yeah. Wait, I need. Let, let me know what dealership you shop at. <laughs> and that's the one I need to visit. Right. Number one, it's a good loan, right? Because they do a credit check and they do all these things to make. Why do they do credit checks to make sure that you pay back? Your debts, right? If there are any loans that you're going to pay them back, that's the first thing. The, the second thing is, is while it's, it is a consumption loan, it, it's important to keep in mind that the creditor and the relationship there is they know this debt is going to take what? It's going to take this, this amount of money and they are not looking at the lump sum. They're looking at what? The monthly payments. That's what matters to the person who is purchasing the car. That's what matters to the finance company. So this is why we can, this is why we look at it as not tax deductible. That's why we look at it as long-term loans. We don't pay them. We can't, we don't give tax on them because that expected amount is not expected to be given that year. I'm only expected to give in that year. How much? The payments. That's it. I'm not expected to give. If I buy a $500,000 house and I'm paying monthly payments of $2,500, how much is the bank expecting from me in that year? Are they expecting $300,000? No. no, they're only expecting the payments for that year. That's why we can deal with them as short. That's why we deal with them in a way that the entirety of the loan is not considered tax deductible. Yes, question. sure. So if I'm a creditor, why, why would I want to give out my money if, um, if I don't generate any profit? Be because in Islam, it is not meant to be a profit-making system. The only way to, how do I make money in Islam? What is an Islamic way of making money? Business. investments, right? If I have cash, if I have capital, the only way for me to increase this capital, what do I need to do with it? I need to invest it. Now, what is different from the investment model versus the loan model? Like, okay, why give loans? Why? So it has to be literally like an act of worship. It is an act of worship. There's no doubt. But I'm saying here in the in the in the Western banking system, why do they give loans? So they can make money. They make money. Okay, well, I can make money in business too, right? And business makes a lot more money. Why here? Why in this way? Um, when you um, loan it, you're not you know taking risks. Uh, there's no risk. Yeah, it's ex ownership. It's it's, it's uh, exactly. It's a very very low risk endeavor. And there's very little chance that the bank will actually lose anything. What is the problem with investment? You participate in profit as well and, as and in loss. loss, right? So you participate in profit and loss. And this is one of the hugest, one of the biggest problems that is with the banking system. And one of the reasons that Allah prohibited what? Thank you. So, yes. Just to follow. So if I'm a Muslim creditor, the only reason I want to loan my money is just, just to help. Yeah, if you're loaning. But if I have a lot of money, what else can I do with it? Invest. I can invest it. Any other questions? So car is not deductible. No, it's not. So uh, mortgage is, is, not is, is not deductible either. Say, so what about my iPhone? It's deductible. So, same reason. It's the same reason because because the, what is the financial expectation for the year, right? You know what? How much money are they expecting from me? Are they expecting the entire payout of the car? No, they're not. So, if the expectations are that much, why can I use that against my zakat? But you can't. But can you use those uh, installments? Yes, yes, you, you can use, remember, we, can, we were talking about one year of installments we can actually deduct. Only one year. Only one year. Because those were the expectations from the creditor in, in one year. That's all right, sit, sit on it, Shalva, and then we, yeah. can, we can come back, we can come back to it.
Uh, so mahar. Mahar is, if the mahar is collected, who gives the zakah? If a woman collects her mahar, who gives the zakah? The women, they don't want to give it. That's why they're like, they're, they're, waiting, they're waiting for me to say the husband. <laughs> so that's not something we need to think about, right? Once a woman collects it, she pays it. Taib, what if it is due and it hasn't been collected? Then we deal with it as debt. We deal with it as debt. Um, and then it could be good debt or bad debt, depending, right? So, you know, situations change. So that's not something we need to worry about. If it's deferred, if it's deferred. Now, do not collected, meaning that I'm supposed, I promised. I said, listen, I'm going to give you the mahar after a year. Two years pass and I still haven't given it. That's what this is talking about, okay? That's what this is talking about. Deferred, what is deferred? So we have in, we have mahar, we have two types, right? We have muajil and we have muakhar. I have immediate and deferred. So deferred, how is it dealt with? The same way as other debts. And we had talked about here, the Hanabila, mashallah, what do they do? <laughs> you pay for every year <laughs> until you collect it. Right? And the Malikis, they say you pay for one year from the time of collection. <laughs> Any questions on this? And then the Mahara only comes up because it's the type of uh, dame, it's the type of debt. Any questions? And we're speaking about the Mahara, the Mahara, why is it? There's huh? a service or a non Yeah, you know, this, this has to be like, yeah, yeah. So this has to be a monetary value. Like, so for example, it's like, okay, I'm going to teach you X amount of Quran, right? That's, that's not something, you know, how do you, you there's no zakat on that. Um, so uh, debtors, what do they do? Uh, consumption debts are tax deductible. And if I give somebody money to use, then the debtor can take that money off the debtor who is the debtor the debtor is the one who who took the money and the opposite holds true we said if it's investment then the debtor actually pays he has to pay the tax that is not tax deductible at that point is, it, is this clear yeah. huh i think i go with the car it's an investment Probably. it can it can it's a type of it's, it's an investment for the if you, if you look from the investment side, as you just mentioned, so if the, if the, uh, since car... Investment in terms of a sale. So because the problem is, what is the main difference between purchasing a house and purchasing a car? The value of the house, what happens? It appreciates. So if the value of the car... Well, in the pandemic, it appreciates. No, in, in, gen in general, it, it depreciates, right? So that, this is a big difference between the, the car and thing. So co even companies are taking a list, even a lease. What is the purpose of the lease? That you're basically paying the amount that the car is depreciating. So that when they go to sell it, they get the entire value of the car that they're actually looking to sell it. Uh, merchandise. So this is Aruz uh, Tijara. This is uh, the, the next section on, there's, there is khilaf, but it's not a big khilaf. The four madahib say that on merchandise, on aruz tijara I have to give zakat. The Zahiris, they say there is no zakat on aruz tijara Why? Because the Zahiris don't use, in general, I won't say in every situation, in general, they don't use qiyas. They don't use analogy. And this... Arud al-Tijara, what do they use analogy for? When I talk about merchandise, based on the four categories we talked about, what are the four categories of zakat? Minus, merchandise is one, obviously, right? We, we have it here. Animals. Okay, animals. What else? Whatever comes from the earth. Uh, whatever comes from the earth. Gold and silver. Gold and silver. So animals, plants, right, in general, whatever comes from the earth, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, gold and silver. These three... Which one is the qiyas for arul al-tijara? Which one is qiyas for merchandise? Gold and the gold and silver. Right, because it's being traded. The same thing that happens with gold and silver. It's not necessary that, um, that plants, animals, these things are necessarily being traded. Sometimes they can be used, but gold and silver are always traded. The same thing with merchandise. So how do, you, how do I determine it? It's based on the value of the goods. If I sell cars, 
I don't have to wait for that car to be one year old. I only have to hold the value of those cars for one year. And it begins with the intention. The moment I decide that I want to sell this item, it becomes a taxable item. It becomes zakah eligible. Uh, it's the same thing applies. So over here, in this case, I dropped below the nisab. Right? This is the nisab. I dropped below the nisab. I would have to pay the zakat according to the Hanbalis. This is the only situation where they don't try to catch you. But you wouldn't pay zakat here. They would say that the moment you drop before nisab, you start a new year here because you came above it. So for them, the year would start here. There would be no, uh, there would be no zakah. For the Hanafis, they would say that you pay zakah. Over here, you are above nisab the whole time, so you actually have to pay zakah. Uh, and this is for the value of the merchandise. The value. What value? Wholesale, retail, right? There's different values for merchandise. The value that I purchase is that. If I purchase a thousand shares, how much will I buy them for? Maybe five dollars each. And how much will I sell them for? let's say seven dollars each do i pay 500 or 700 dollars? which one would i pay zakat on 700. or would i pay on the difference 200 dollars? right there's three <laughs> there's three numbers here mm -hmm. 500 is the wholesale price 700 is the retail price and 200 dollars is the difference because i paid the 500 dollars, right i paid it to purchase these goods what do you guys think the difference would make sense because we know it's but what did we say about the merchandise itself? That it's analogy on gold and, gold and silver. So basically, I traded gold and silver for another type of gold and silver. Let's we'll start. We'll pause for the other. Uh, so basically, again, this is the value of the merchandise. This is not the actual merchandise itself. Uh, and we'll talk about, can I give zakat in kind? Uh, for example, if the value of my lot where I sell cars, I have 100 cars, and the value of my zakat equals to one car, can I give one car in zakat? We'll talk about it, inshallah. What wholesale and retail price? Oh, yes. <laughs> so how do we deal with the wholesale and retail? We'll, we'll talk about that also. And we'll talk about where the difference applies. Most scholars will say that the difference applies depending on who the sale is. If you're a wholesaler, you would, say you would pay these account on the wholesale price. If you're a retailer, you'll pay on the retail price. But I believe that you would pay on the wholesale price regardless because there's no guarantee you'll sell the goods. So what is the minimum threshold? It is the same. Remember, we had said that the qiyas is on dhahab al fiddah, right? The qiyas is on uh, gold and silver. So if I have the value of this or the value of this, which one applies to merchandise? The, the gold standard or the silver standard? Uh, the gold or the gold is approximately like $4,100 or something. Silver is like what? You guys know? 700, right? I think it's like around 700 right now. So which one applies? What is the minimum threshold? What is the nisab? Do you think it's gold? In the matas, as far as you know, whichever is lower? Whichever is lower, yeah. So for the Hanbalis, remember, ta like super taxing, right? So you, even, even with gold and silver, even with gold and silver, when they talked about naqt, when they talk about currency, they would still apply this. And many currencies, like I think from the, like even the US dollar at one point was backed by silver, not by uh, gold. Um, so how is the zakat paid? And this is what we talked about. Can I give zakat? It's paid generally in currency. Generally, it's paid in, in currency. Um, it's not given in merchandise. Why? So if I have 100 cars, why can't I give one car in zakat? It's not universally usable. Right. It's, it's not necessarily usable. A car might be, right? <laughs> but, but there are other things that people own. Uh, if I have toys, for example, if I sell toys and I give zakat in toys, is a toy something tangible, something usable? Like if somebody's hungry, can they, <laughs> can they eat, use a toy? Right, <laughs> uh, because it's usually again it's not useful for the poor there are exceptions right there are, are exceptions uh, can zakat be given in kind uh, there is a difference of opinion the Hanafis say yes the Hanafis say yes so if you replace it with something else uh, if I pay somebody's rent if I pay their electric bill if I pay um, for furniture they will say that it is allowed to be used in that way it does not have to be money uh, the Jamhur say no 
the Jumhur say, no, Ibn Taymiyyah says it depends on which one brings greater uh, benefit. Uh, How is merchandise calculated? Again, uh, wholesale. This is in general the Shafi and the Hanbali position. Uh, retail, the Hanbalis, they say, if you sell it wholesale, basically what is this saying? If you're a wholesaler, you would sell it wholesale. You would pay zakat on wholesale. If you sell it retail, you would, because remember, Hanbali is always about maximizing that tax, right? Uh, so that would be the case in the, the Shafis. They say you pay wholesale regardless. You pay wholesale uh, regardless. Uh, they also say you can combine. You can combine all, if, if I have traded goods, if I have, for example, $3,800 in goods, and I believe that the gold is the nisab, and I have cash, according to the Hanbalis, you would pay with the personal savings. So I would add the personal savings to my business savings, and I would actually give zakah on those things. Uh, if things change in tension, this is going to take a little bit longer. <laughs> So if I have a traded good and then I change it to personal use and then I change my intention again to traded use, how do I deal with that? And this is something inshallah we'll talk more about next week. We have about five minutes for question and answers and then after that inshallah nine o'clock is, uh, is Aisha. Any re related or unrelated? Yeah, a related question on merchandise. Since you just said uh, merchandise is a result of uh, Riyadh, yeah. and it doesn't make, now that it doesn't make much, a lot of sense to me. And then sure. Because Zahari Yafir makes more sense. More sense. Uh -huh. Gold and silver were uh, means of exchange, means of exchange and a store sure. of value. Mm -hmm. But merchandise per se is not, is not of those. Why would you, why would it not be a store of value? So if I was a chair reseller, well, there are certain conditions that uh, has to apply for something to be money. Sure. Uh, in the economic theory, uh, and secondly, merchandise. Well, what do you do with merchandise? You sell and you get money. Mm -hmm. That money you could is it becomes so you receive cash and that is uh -huh. money. Good. Merchandise is not money. Motor right. oil. Also. Toys for adults, sure. toys for kids, yeah. not money per se. You, it's pretty hard to exchange something for these. So that, there is a system in place for that. What do we call it? If I exchange a chair for a pen, what is that called? It's called bartering, bartering. right? What is bar what is, essentially, what is bartering? That you see value in the item that you're giving me, and I see value in the item I'm giving you, and we exchange based on that. What is currency? It ex it's an exchange of? value, right? I see that chair to be worth five of these papers. And I exchange that. So the, the, I, I see what you're saying. I totally get what you're saying, but I'm saying this would be the counter argument. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think that it's uh, saying that Arul uh, Tijara is not taxable. I don't think it's a very weak argument. Does that make sense? I, I think they have a very valid, they have a valid strong argument, but it is safer to definitely pay pay the zakat on the on the merchandise, because the counter argument is like, okay, you don't pay it on the merchandise, you pay it on the profits, right? You eventually you're going to pay it some way. Either you're going to pay it on the merchandise, or you're going to pay it on the profits. And if you don't have to give tax on the merchandise, what are you going to do with that money? You're probably going to reinvest it, right? And and the whole purpose behind this entire system is to keep money moving in an Islamic society. So the, but, but the arguments are good both ways, honestly. Uh, I, I just think the Jamhur argument is safer. Thank you, Salatah. It's all right. Sit on it. Think about it, inshallah. Uh, I don't know. That's not, it's not, there is, as, as you mentioned earlier, there is no uh, guarantee you, you'll, you'll sell your, your merchandise. Your goods. Product. Yeah, for sure. Sometimes, and not just that, there are some goods that are meant to be held for years at a time before they're sold, yeah. right? So it, it is, don't get me wrong. I, I think the arguments for the Lahiris are very strong mm -hmm. in, in this. I just think it's safer to, uh, to pay. And Allah knows best. Inshallah, I'll see you guys after Asha.